You know, there were two pivotal moments in my life where I truly felt hopeless. Um, 2018, I graduated from LSU and I was looking for a job. Um, I put in 138 applications and I just felt very defeated. I did not feel that good enough that I will pretty much pursue my dreams. And first week of July, the Lord granted me two interviews with two different companies. And the same week I was hired on. I was excited. I was a young engineer. Started my first day at my new job. Three months into it, I was trained for my new job. And then the guy who was training me had to leave and go back to our headquarters. And man, it was an overflow of ruckus and trouble. My plate felt so heavy. I was working 10 to 12 hour days and I just didn't know what to do. I just felt so hopeless that God, you've given me this opportunity of a lifetime and then turn around and I'm, I'm stressed and I don't know what to do, Lord. And I didn't just understand, you know, why did he put me where I was at that time? Well, fast forward a year or two later, I am so grateful that I felt that hopelessness and I gained victory over that hopelessness because I've met so many great people at this company. I've established so many lifetime and long-term friendships and these people are just like family to me. I have been a guiding light to certain folks and certain folks have been my mentors for the last two to three years. So in that pivot moment of hopelessness, God used that in his purpose to make me a better man. Second pivotal moment in my life was last year. Um, coronavirus hit everybody and I had never truly been lonely. For once in my life, I actually had to get to know myself. And at that moment, I felt lonely, I felt hopeless because I was like, God, when is this gonna end? When are you gonna, you know, speed things up a little bit here? But I'm so happy that I was lonely for those last those few months because God used that loneliness to bring me closer to Him. Being hopeless can just make you feel dead, right? It can make you feel as though you're in a grave. But through the victory of Jesus, hope is greater than the grave. See, God used those moments in my life so I can be victorious and to overcome that grave and get out more righteous, more victorious, more excited through the love of Jesus Christ. Hope is greater than the grave. Holding out for hope in the midst of complete darkness can seem impossible, but praise God that nothing is impossible with Jesus. I'm all too familiar with grief and loss, losing two babies to miscarriage, then witnessing my husband die in a boating accident all within a few months left me feeling completely hopeless and depressed. Some nights were just so incredibly dark and almost unbearable. I don't know how I would have made it to where I am today if it weren't for hope in Christ. I couldn't see it at the time, but he was holding me through the night and pushing me to just make it to the morning where his mercies were new and there was light again. I love how Psalm says, even the darkness is not dark to him for it is as bright as the day. He has made my heart whole again. I've chosen to let his grace hold me now. And while things are not perfect, I delight in all the blessings God has given me. He has allowed me to find love again with my husband, Andy. We have suffered our own heartache of having four miscarriages, but God was faithful and he gave us two precious miracles. He was my hope when I was at my complete rock bottom where all I saw was darkness and he continues to be my hope on the brightest of days. I find joy in Christ and rejoice because he has risen. From a childless widow to a blessed wife and mother, only by the grace of God. I believe that hope is greater than the grave. And I know through every battle, the victory is found in Him, in Him alone. Come on, put your hands together for all the good going on in Acacia. Keep that going because it's Easter Sunday and Jesus is alive. Come on, come on, come on. Man, it's so good to see all of you in the house this morning. It really, really is. And uh, we want to do one more thing. If you're new uh, to Acacia, we have another campus up on Old Hammond Highway. And then uh, we have some people that will be joining us online and on the app and whatnot. And so would everybody do me a favor and put your hands together and welcome Old Hammond and everybody else. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. 
So put your seatbelt on. We're going to move fast. Uh, I do want to call your attention to this response card. Uh, don't do anything with it now. We're going to circle back around to that, but keep that bad boy close to you because today is all about hope. On the count of three, everybody say hope really, really loudly. One, two, three. Everything is pointed towards the hope that Jesus gives us. And every time that I begin to talk about hope, uh, my mind goes back to a story. I've shared this before, but it's my favorite story in reference to hope. And so my wife and I, by this time in our lives, we had been married 20 years, and we had saved up a long time. Man, we had saved up frequent flyer miles and money and all the different things that you can save up. And we took a Mediterranean cruise to celebrate 20 years. I mean, come on, guys. She has access to this for 20 years. I mean, you know, <laughs> it, it was a celebration for her and, and me. And so we go on this cruise. And, and the thing about a cruise, I don't know, I'm, I'm just the fellas, it's just me and you in the house, okay? I don't know if y'all been on a cruise, but whenever you step onto the boat, you become romantic. Like you, 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 your, your words are better. You're smoother. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's a wonderful time. And so Stephanie and I are on this boat. We're celebrating 20 years of marriage. And, and guys, it was like a movie. I mean, it was absolutely fantastic because we we're going through this little area called the Straits of Messina. And you're, you're going to think I'm making it up, but it was for real. On one side of the boat, you've got the southern tip of Italy. And then on the other side of the boat, you've got the, the side of the northern coast of, of Sicily, and it was just, it was absolutely perfect. And so 20 years of marriage, 20 years of being in love, I'm romantic. I look her deep in the eyes, and I just said, do you think that you could survive if I pushed you off? <laughs> and that was not exactly uh, the kind of language that you want to use on your 20th anniversary. Just a little side note there, guys. But we laughed and we giggled, but she said something very profound. She said, yeah, I could swim to the side because, because as long as I could see land, I think that I could keep on swimming. Now, I'm not sure exactly if she could actually do it because it was quite a distance between the two bodies of land, but that right there is a perfect illustration of what hope looks like. If you can see a solution, if you can see a maybe, if you can see, uh, it, it, it's a possibility. It just gives you something on the inside of you to help you keep swimming. Is there anybody understanding what I'm saying already? I mean, it kind of gives you something to kind of help you keep going. And so that just allowed us to look at hope from a different perspective, and that's what I want to happen to you here today. I want you to just listen to this Easter story from a new perspective, and I want you to see hope from a brand new realm of reality. And so it may sound ironic to begin with here, but to talk about the life of hope, we're actually going to begin by talking about the death and the grave. So let's go back to 1922. And there's a gentleman by the name of Howard Carter who was a British, British archaeologist and he became very famous because he discovered the tomb of King Tut, the famous Egyptian pharaoh. Other tombs in Egypt had been found before this one, but what made this one so incredibly unique and what made this so profound is what all was in Taste or enclosed inside of this tomb. There was so much wealth that they had placed down into this tomb. Listen, guys, it took eight weeks to bring the 5,400 pieces of whatever out of there. There was it was a solid gold coffin, a golden face mask all around the room, chests that were full of jewels and, and gold, and there were even seven full-size boats because the, the ancient Egyptians had this theory about sailing into the afterlife. And even though King Tut only ruled for 10 years, we actually know a lot about his life and the other pharaohs because of the objects that were recovered from their tomb. And so you can even say this, graves tell us an awful lot about a person. Now, over my years of ministry, I've had the privilege or the unfortunate duty to, uh, to do quite a few funerals in, in my day. And I remember one time we were serving at a church in Austin, Texas, and in one week we did two funerals that were about as different as you could possibly imagine because one of them, the gentleman's name was Charles, and we buried him. They buried him in a custom, privately built mausoleum that cost probably as much as some of our houses. It was a massive, ornate structure. It was just for him and his wife. It, I'd never seen anything like it before, never seen anything like it since. We buried Charles, they put him in this mausoleum, and it was just, it was absolutely unbelievable. Later that same week, we buried a gentleman by the name of Ben. First time in my life I've ever seen this happen, but they literally, and I mean literally, hand on the Bible, literally buried him in a cardboard box. And so in one week, 
you see these two different stories. You see these two different men. You could even say that tombs and graves themselves are often said to be the summation of one's life. And so today, I want to talk about the greatest tomb of all time. It is a tomb that changed the world forever. But unlike the tomb of King Tut that was completely full, today I'm preaching about a tomb that was completely empty. Somebody put your hands together and celebrate that empty tomb. So we're going to be looking at John. John is the fourth book in the New Testament. It's the story of Jesus written from John's perspective. And you have to understand at this point in the story, all hope was lost. If you're familiar, even if you're vaguely familiar with the story of Christ, you know that, that he was the promised Messiah. So much hope was put in him. So much effort was put in him. But, but now all hope was gone because Jesus had died. And now not only had he died, but he was buried. And so we pick up in John chapter 20, verse 1. It goes like this. Early on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. That's the Sunday that we're celebrating today. today. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Verse 3 says, so Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, and, but, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And he bent over and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the clothes that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. And listen to this. The clothes were still lying in, in their place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. And he saw and he believed. That's what I'm challenging you to do today. I want you to see this story from a brand new perspective. And if you've never considered believing in the, the Lord Jesus, then that's what I want to, to challenge you with today. Because here's the thing. Up to this point, you got to catch the context. Up to this point, death had never been beaten. Nothing had ever overcome death, hell, and the grave. The dead, whenever they died, they had always stayed, they, they, they stayed dead, right? I mean, that, that's just kind of how it had always happened. The grave had always been greater than hope. But on that first Easter Sunday, he overcame death, hell, and the grave. And suddenly, hope became greater than the grave. Suddenly, hope became greater than the grave. And so the concept that we celebrate in the passage that we just read there, it's not just an ancient day uh, story. It's not just an ancient day incident, but it is a modern day application. And I want you to see it in that perspective today because, you see, because of the resurrection and because of Easter, the hope that we find in Jesus is greater than the hopelessness that we find in the grave. And I want to say that one more time because I want you to help me celebrate it. Hope that we find in Jesus is greater than the hopelessness that we find in the grave. Come on, we're clap happy around Acacia. And so hopefully at this point, there's some of you asking, okay, here's the question. You'll see it on the screen. How does this story that happened so long ago how does that give us hope now? Like, how does this story that happened then matter to us, and how does it give us hope now? Well, today, I'm going to give you two reasons. The first one is this. We have hope because of the power of Jesus. And I want you to just kind of say that with me. We have hope because of the power of Jesus. The tombs in Egypt are famous because they contain the bodies of these Egyptian pharaohs. Westminster Abbey in London is revered because of all the bodies that are lying there of English noblemen. Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C. is respected and it's valued and revered because of the, the honored resting place of those outstanding Americans that, that are lying there. But the tomb of Jesus is famous for something completely different. It's not famous for what's in it. It's famous for what is not in it. The unoccupied tomb showcases the power of the Lord because it transforms the lives of everyone who believes. Because it's not just an ancient story about something that happened back then, but it applies to our life today. Everybody say power. power. It reminds me of the story whenever I was eight years old, my brother and I were riding motorcycles down a gravel road. And if you grew up in the country, this is going to maybe resonate with you. We're, we're driving down this, this gravel road, and my brother just, I don't know what he gets into, but he starts fishtailing. 
and ends up wrecking in the ditch. And, and, and it was like this little, this little situation of various mud puddles that he fell in. It wasn't just a giant mud puddle. It was several different mud puddles. And the way that he fell, and guys, it could have been absolutely tragic. He could have died. Because as he's laying there, the only thing that was above the water was his face right here. So he's looking out like this, and he's like, help! Well, and the motorcycle had landed up on him, and so he couldn't move. He, could, he couldn't pick it up off of him. And I'm eight years old on my little Honda Z50, and I'm just looking at him like, no way that just happened, right? I mean, there's, there's no way. And so he's, how? Oh, I'm going to die. And so I went over there, and I, and I tried to pick it up. And I didn't have the strength. And looking back, it's probably because all of the strength was going to my eyes because my eyes were so wide open. I was like, I can't, I can't do this. And so he's screaming at me. He says, go get Dad. I'm going to die. And so I get on the Honda Z50, and I go back, and I said, Dad, come on. Greg's about to die. And he goes, and he goes, and he just walks up. And my dad walks up, and, and he lifts up very easily. He just reaches in, and he lifts up that Yamaha up off of my brother, and, and we all live happily ever after. Now, listen, here's the thing. My, my father... My father had power and strength that I didn't. I had to learn to lean on him to help me accomplish what I couldn't. And this morning, I'm not talking about physical power. I'm talking about spiritual power. Because power over death meant power over everything. Power over death meant power over everything. And that meant that hope was finally greater than the grave. And listen how the Apostle Paul makes the Easter story so personal. On the screen, 1 Corinthians 15. For what I, this is Paul writing to the church in, in, in Corinth. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. In other words, this is very important. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Again, this is not just an ancient story that happened back then. This is a modern day application that can be applied to our life today. Here's how, real quickly. This first thing, Jesus had the power to defeat sin. Anybody thankful that he's helped you defeat your sin in your life? Amen. Yeah. And so back in the Old Testament, how this, how this went down is whenever you committed a sin, blood had to be shed in order for that sin to be forgiven. And Jesus made sure that he defeated our sin. The second thing that you can find in this, the second quick thing you can find in the scriptures, Jesus had the power to defeat the grave. Because the, the scripture said he was buried, but, but he was raised on that third day according to the scriptures. And so the thing that had never been beaten before, suddenly Jesus had the power to beat it. And then look who Jesus revealed his power to. I love this. Scripture says that he revealed it to the twelve. Who's the twelve? The 12 disciples that had been walking with him and talking with him for so long. But in Jesus' greatest hour, they ran, as my dad would say, like scalded dogs. And in that moment, they had an opportunity to turn their back on Jesus and run from him. And that's exactly what they did. But notice that the scripture also makes sure that, they, that it points out the apostle Peter. And I love that because Peter didn't just have a crisis of faith, but he outright denied the Lord back to back to back. Because if you remember in the scripture, someone comes up to him when Jesus is getting arrested and said, do you know him? Nope, I don't know him. You sure you don't know him? Nope, I don't know him. Are you real sure you don't know him? Nope, I do not know who you're talking about. And the point that 1 Corinthians is making here, and I think that the Lord is trying to say, is he's trying to make sure that everyone who isn't perfect, and that's you, and that's me, he wants to make sure everyone who isn't perfect realizes that they have access to a spiritual power that they've never had before. That's why 1 Corinthians says it like this in 6 and 14. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us up too. That means because of the grave, that same resurrection power is available for each one of us today. It is a spiritual resurrection that happens inside of our life. And so what I'm hoping this morning that you'll understand is because of God's power and because of this Easter Sunday, I'm hoping that you see this story differently. I'm, I'm hoping that you hear this story differently. Because it's not just a story that you hear, it's something that you get to encounter. Look at how the author Bruce Larson puts it. The events of Easter could not be reduced to a creed or a philosophy. We are not asked to believe the doctrine of the resurrection. We're asked to meet this person raised from the dead. I love that. In faith, we move from belief in a doctrine to knowledge of a person. The Christian faith allows us to literally meet him and know him all because he is alive. 
And I love how the Apostle Paul continues in Ephesians. And by the way, this is our, this is our starting point anchor. If you've never been through starting point, this is what the whole thing is built on right here. Ephesians 1. Paul is, again, is writing to a church and he says, I pray that the, the eyes of your heart would be opened. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And that power that raised him up from the dead is the same power that gets placed inside of you whenever you are, as Paul says, in Christ. Talk about a life change. Talk about something that's radically different whenever you begin to understand that hope is greater than the grave. So we have hope this Easter because of the power of Jesus. And number two, we have hope because of the the purpose of Jesus. Hope is greater than the grave because of the Lord's power, but also because of the Lord's purpose. And I want you to lean in, and I want you to let me talk to you right here, because I want you to listen to this. Jesus did not just come to earth so that he could suffer and die and we could have a good story. He did not come to this earth so that he could suffer and die and we could just talk about this. Jesus came on a mission. Jesus came for a reason. Luke 19 and 10 makes it so plain. He came to seek and save Those who were lost. And again, I want to be as clear as I can possibly be. That's why I'm slowing down because I want you to hear every word that's coming out of my mouth. Jesus came here on a mission. And you know what his mission is? You. He came for you. As emotional as the story is, as moving as the story is, and it brings us all to tears, yes, yes, and yes. But he came here for a reason, and that reason is you. And that reason is you. And that reason is you. And that reason is me. Me, us, we, people are his purpose. And so listen, I want you to hear this. With tremendous clarity. Yes, Jesus came so that he could make a way for us to to go to heaven. But you have to understand, Jesus didn't come just to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. Man, that fires me up. He came for a reason. He came for a purpose. And that reason is you. And that purpose is me. So this Easter Sunday, may we all be reminded of something incredibly important. And again, if you've been napping the whole time or you've been daydreaming the whole time and you're just wondering where you go to lunch, that's cool. But focus in and let me, I want you to listen to this right here. You matter to Jesus. You matter to Jesus and let that give you hope today. This is so incredibly important because of our our modern world that we live in. It has so many people struggling to have hope because they see the Easter message as someone who could help somebody else, but you're not sure if it could help you. Or even if you do understand the context, you're like, I don't even know how it applies to me. And I understand that it's a great old story. And whenever I hear some preacher talk about it, it moves my soul and it makes me tear up. And and whenever I see Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, I cry like there's no tomorrow. But I don't understand how it really applies to me and my world right now in 2021. And I want to tell you, the reason is, is because you matter to Jesus. You matter to Jesus. And we preach on this often at Acacia, and we're going to continue to preach on it often at Acacia because of this. You'll see it on the screen. The struggle of self-worth hinders hope. When you don't see yourself as the Lord sees you, then you really can't understand the level of love that the Lord has for you. Because the enemy has done a great job to convince some of us that we'll never amount to anything. We'll never get cleaned up enough. We'll never be good enough. We'll never be perfect. And that's why I want to go back and one more time and point to you. That's why in 1 Corinthians, Paul is saying, hey, do you, do you, do you understand who all is involved in this? Even the 12, this message of Jesus is for the 12, those imperfect 12 that walked with Jesus. At least you've got an excuse. Like, you didn't walk with Jesus for three years, right? You're like, hey, I messed up. I, I mean, he died a long time ago, right? I mean, I heard stories about it, but these men walked with him slept with him, ate with him, were, 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 were hearing his teachings, camped out with him. They were right there with him. And then Pete, I don't know the man. I don't know the man. I don't know the man. 
And we want to make sure Jesus understands, every, Jesus wants to make, every, make sure that everybody understands that this message is even for the imperfect people, even for those people who struggle with their self worth. And so this reminds me, this idea of purpose reminds me of a great story about this young lady by the name of Lisa. She was a gym and jewelry dealer, and she's strolling through the aisles in Tucson, Arizona at the gym and mineral show. And she noticed a, a blue violet stone about the, say, the, the size and the shape of a potato. And Lisa looked it over as calmly as she could, and she went to the vendor and she says, Sir, you're wanting $15 for this? And the guy thought that she was going to try to like lower the price, and so he just, I'm going to go ahead and solve this problem. And he said, yes, ma'am. He said, but it's not as pretty as the other ones. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you for, for 10 bucks." And so she quietly reached in her purse or her pocket and pulled out $10 and gave it to him, and she walked out. And now the stone has been certified as a 1,905-carat natural star sapphire. And the latest appraisal on it is $2.3 million. So listen. It took Lisa, a lover of stones, to recognize the worth of the sapphire. And it took Jesus, a lover of sinners, to recognize the value of someone like you and like me. And so here's the whole message. Here's how all this fits together. Because of his power and because of his purpose, you can overcome anything that tries to overcome you. The divorce the addiction, the depression, the financial woes, the family strife, fill in the blank, on and on and on, all the things that all of us have to battle. In the last 18 months, all the things that life has thrown at us, we've gotten off course on the idea of his power, and we've gotten off course on the idea of his purpose but I want to tell you today that this Easter message should remind you that you can overcome anything that is trying to overcome you. Because you see, we go back to this concept of death one more time. Because in, in our earthly realm of reality, there's nothing stronger than the power of death. But when Jesus overcame death, he ushered in a brand new realm of reality. He ushered in a brand new realm of, of seeing things, a brand new way of, of seeing things. And we have the power of hope this morning because he overcame the very thing that no one had ever overcome before him or has overcome since him. And so I just want to let you know this morning, I want to go on record and tell you, I have hope this morning. I have great hope this morning because of the power that I find in Jesus and the purpose that I find in Jesus. And you can find the same thing. You can have that same thing. So listen, don't make this complicated. Don't make the Easter message complicated. It's actually quite simple. Because of the empty grave, our hearts are full. I want to say it again, maybe a little bit more succinctly, because of the grave is empty, we can be filled. We can be filled with the hope of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ. Because of Easter, because of the resurrection, hope is greater than the grave, and hope is within your reach. Hope is within your reach. Literally. Listen. Literally. Hope is within your reach. To tell you how literally, let me ask you if you remember Howard Carter. We talked about him earlier. His life was forever changed when he discovered the tomb of King Tut, but here's the rest of the story. As the old school Paul Harvey would say, here's the rest of the story. His life could have changed and should have changed much sooner because he found these steps on November the 4th, 1922. And whenever he found them, they uncovered them and he put a light down inside and started looking around. And they asked him, what do you see, Howard? And he came back with just two words and he said, marvelous things, marvelous things. And then he picked his head up and listen to what he did. He picked his head up and he sat down beside that hole that they had just uncovered and he put his hands in, up like this and he put his head down in his hands and he just began to weep, like, like weeping, not just crying, but, but weeping, crying, weeping. And they asked him, what, what's, what's wrong, Howard? What, why, why are you weeping? And this is what he said. He said, I'm crying and I'm, I'm distraught because 10 years ago I dug a hole 18 inches from that hole right there. Ten years ago, I was so close 
to discovering the thing that I had spent my life chasing. I was so close, and I missed it. I was, I was right there, but I missed it. And literally within 18 inches of you this morning is that response card. And if you're joining us online, they're putting a link to the response card in the comments right now. But I want to ask everybody under the sound of my voice to grab that response card right now. And I'll tell you, I make no bones about it. I'm shooting for 100% this morning. My goal is 100% of everybody that's under the sound of my voice. Because here's what you have to understand as you're grabbing this card. Because of the story of the resurrection, this story is not just a story for us to review. This is a story that demands a response. And so on the front, you'll see there's some information for you to update your information. I mean, some, some space there for you to update your information. If you want to put out a prayer request, you can. Everybody comes to church on Easter. Most, most people come to church on Easter. This is a great time for us just to update this information. And then if you turn it over, there's just some ways that maybe you can help us get some clarity on some things that maybe we can be preaching over the next little while to help you wherever you are. But I want you to look at the bottom where it says A, B, C, and D. And I want you to lean in as closely as you've leaned in all day. And I want you to listen to me. Because I'm asking everybody in the building to check A, B, C, or D and listen to me. If you check A, you'll see it on the screen. It's saying, I already have a relationship with Jesus, but I'm just affirming that commitment to him today. I already have a relationship with Jesus, but I'm just re-upping that commitment today. If you check letter B, I want to begin a relationship with the Lord today. And you might say something like, I, I need what you talked about today, preacher. Today has helped me, and, and I need Jesus. I, I, I want to understand what, it's, what, it, what it means to give my heart to the Lord and to give my life to him and to start learning about him and, and, and how to follow his teachings. And, and I, I want you guys to help me with that conversation today. And, and what, what better day of Easter to do just that? Because, listen, guys, if you've never done that, that has to be step one. That's where it all begins. But let's look at C and D, because if you check C, this is where those of you who would check it, if you're saying, I'm not quite ready to fully say yes to Jesus today. And, and, and if you're here, you're like, you got me closer today, preacher, but, but not quite there. And if this is you, thank you for your honesty, and I want to tell you, you were safe at Acacia Church, and you're welcome at Acacia Church as you continue that journey forward. And if you check letter D, you're saying, I likely will never say yes to Jesus. And if that's you, if that's what you're checking, it's okay. I appreciate your honesty. I'm just asking you to have the courage to, to be honest today. And if you're checking D, I want to let you know that I'm going to keep praying for you, and I believe that God's going to keep reaching for you. Acacia, that was an amazing word from Pastor Russ. Now we've got some next steps for you. If this is your first time watching with us this evening, we'd love for you to click the link in the comment to fill out a digital connect card so we can start a conversation with you. One of our cultural values here at Acacia is that we practice generosity. If you'd like to partner with us, you can click the Give link in the comments below to help support the mission, vision, and culture of Acacia Church. Thanks so much for being with us this evening. We'll see you next week.